Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin right away with the next session. Welcome to this session. I'd request you to sit down if you're standing in the aisles and not carry out any conversation there now. Thank you very much. My name is Vivek Atre. I'll be chairing slash moderating this session, which is uh, a session of very eminent people. And uh, we have a dazzling uh, array of speakers, if I may say so, from various fields. The topic of the plenary is setting the agenda for India's economy. Just to briefly introduce the speakers, we have Mr. Sunil Khan Munjal, who is the chairman of Hero uh, Corporate Services, Hero Enterprises. He's a social entrepreneur, he's a thought leader, he's a successful business leader. I know he's involved with higher education and skill development as well. And uh, he's going to be joined by Mr. Rajiv Kaul, who is the chairman of the NICO Group. He's the head of IMA, he's the former president of CII, and he also has a wonderful initiative to make children smile through the NICO uh, Smile Initiative, the NICO uh, philanthropic uh, initiative which is being carried out. And then we have uh, Mr. Neil Stevenson, who is uh, the MD of the International Integrated Reporting Council from the UK. And he's an expert in accountancy and integrated reporting. Also has interest in music and keeping fit, mm -hmm. which I think uh, most of us have, or if we don't, we should. <laughs> uh, then we have uh, Dr. Somitra Datta, who is a renowned professor from Cornell. He's from IIT Delhi. And he is, uh, Somitra is a champion of the digital economy. He's also been an expert on social networking. And he runs something called the Global, Develop Global Innovation Index. So that is a very eminent panel we have. Just to set the ball rolling and just to set the tone, just a few opening remarks. And you notice I'm standing just to break the monotony. Otherwise, I could have been sitting there, but I will be. Um, India's economy, we've been discussing it in the last session as well. Just a few points, we know that the economic survey said 7 to 7.5% growth expected, one of the largest and fastest growing economies. But are we actually impacting the common man? That's the issue that we also need to address. There are various success stories. We had a very boisterous, very optimistic session, and there's so many things good about India. Not the least of which is the ease of doing business in which we have broken into the top 100 rankings, which is, for India, a big deal. Because as a former administrator, I know how difficult it is to have things happening on the ground level. And that is something we need to do. One of the worries which we don't have is how we're going to fare at the Football World Cup. Because mm -hmm. we're not playing the World Cup, right? But India has also broken into the top 100 of the soccer rankings for the first time ever. So watch out. You never know in a couple of World Cups, we might be there. Good wishes to Spain, though, which is my favorite team at the moment. And also, I am an advocate of basics. So the education and healthcare scenario in India still has a lot to be desired unless we have skill development happening in leaps and bounds, and that young Indian, he has to be employable, or she has to be employable by the industry, which is represented here partly on the panel. The thing is that, is that Indian equipped for the global era? Is that Indian equipped for the global economy? And I would name four women from India, in no particular order, who are if I may say so, common women. Mehru Nisa, who's a bouncer. Devki Joshi, who's a sub-inspector with the Delhi police. Bhavna Paliwal, who's a private detective. And Shubhangi Mandare, who's a fire brigade officer. Are we actually impacting the common Indian with all the economic progress that we're making? Yes, to some extent. No, to another extent. Are we encouraging enough the tourism industry, for example? India still has only 10 million tourists per annum. Singapore has 17 million, which is more than double its population. India has scope for 10 times more tourism. We can have so much employment, so much economic progress through the services sector, yes, but tourism, hospitality. In IT, India was first, 
focusing on cost arbitrage, getting the benefit of low cost services. Now India has risen in the world rankings of IT quality. So can we not do so in the other services? And can we not also make more headway in the manufacturing sector? These are some of the pointers for a very glittering, as I said, array of uh, panelists. And I'm going to request Mr. Rajiv Call to make the opening remarks with two or three points which he feels India needs to focus on as we look at India in the coming era in terms of economy. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Atre. Uh, I think the, the, the scope that India has, you've covered in some of your remarks as to how, how much potential we have, right? But before I come to the potential, let me just mention that it took us 60 years after our independence, 60 years, when in the year 2007, we achieved one trillion US dollars GDP. Well, the next trillion came in seven years, right? Where in 2014, we achieved two trillion. We are already 2.6, little more than that trillion economy. And certainly in the next uh, five, not next, but from 2014 to 2020, we'll positively be over three, three trillion dollars, right? So that's kind of the pace of growth that we are doing. Now, if you look at in terms of our global standing, uh, in 1995, we were 16th in the world. 2000, we became 14th in the world. 2005, we became 13th in the world. 2010, we rose to 10th. 2015, we became the 8th. And by 2020, we'll be the 5th behind the economies of USA, China, Japan, and Germany. So that's the trend we are on. And to a large extent, that will be achieved on the back of many of the, the potential areas that you said. But what is really driving this? It is demographics. It's been talked earlier the last session. We have 650 million young people. And we have the youngest and largest workforce in the world right up to 2030. Right? When we may not have the youngest, but we'll still have the largest. Right? The pace of reforms, which began in 1991, so it's taken us some time. So it's not, we've not done it overnight. But what happens when you have the momentum in your favor and the ball starts rolling, it gains momentum and gains in pace. And therefore, the acceleration of the time taken to add your next trillion in GDP reduces. And soon a stage comes, like in China, every year you're adding a trillion. That's going to happen uh, very, very much sooner than actually people project. Urbanization is another very major force driving our economy, because urbanization leads to consumer demand. And India today is grown substantially on consumer demand. The investment that is being pumped in is not adequate, and a lot more is required. And tourism was one example you gave. We lack infrastructure. So that is another area. And of course, the fourth industrial revolution, the digital age, the knowledge era which India is in, really we have a very strong base. And the strong base is created because of the software engineers which began you know, uh, 20, 25 years ago. And that has led and given us a big advantage uh, as, as we move forward. But I think let me pause now because we're not supposed to talk too long. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I have a very disciplined panel, I can assure you. <laughs> and we're going to keep this snappy and interactive. So just to add to what Rajiv said, the juggernaut is the term used in the previous session. The juggernaut has inertia. It has, you know, an elephant. When he, when he gets up, he's difficult to... But once he starts moving, yeah. he's unstoppable. However, as I said, we need to carry the common people along, and you rightly pointed out as well. So I'm going to, uh, the, this batting order is going to be a little uh, shifty. 
We're going to have Neil Stevenson now from the UK, and he's an expert on integrated reporting to give his perspective on India's economy going forward. Well, thank you. Firstly, it's my first um, opportunity to be at a Harassis event, so thank you for welcoming me to what is obviously a great family. Um, and we like to think of the integrated reporting movement as a global family as well, and we welcome actually many companies already into our global family. We work with CII closely, um, with KPMG, another partner, but also a number of uh, leading companies such as the Tata Group, um, ITC, Mahindra Rise, um, Reliance Industries. So, so integrated reporting has, has taken off. And when, when I think of the um, Indian economy, well, we've talked a lot, and I'm not going to repeat the things we've already heard, but I, I, the other thing that we haven't spoken about today is a lot of the corporate governance reforms that have been happening in India in recent years, um, which are actually helping Indian boards and directors to um, sort of elevate their thinking to um, international best practice. Um, and integrated reporting is seen very much as part of that. And indeed, SEBI, your securities regulator, last year asked your 500 leading companies to adopt integrated reporting. And, and I say that because actually corporate governance reform is happening around the world as there's an unease with what companies are focusing on. They need a, to think about their purpose more. And, and corporate governance codes around the world, from South Africa to Japan, in India, Malaysia, or now Australia and the Netherlands, are all thinking about encouraging boards to have a longer term focus and actually think much more in the round about the resources that they are relying on and, and using to create value over time. And indeed, to think much more clearly about their impact on social capital and uh, natural capital, but also um, think very much more about the resources that they depend on at the core of their business. And you were talking about um, software. Well, that's, that's not a traditional financial capital. It's about your expertise, your know-how, and your people. So what we're actually seeing, and my, my two issues, to, to be brief, are firstly, the changing nature of value, and the secondly, how we can scale up to meet the, the big investment opportunities that are now um, with us. So the changing nature of value, I, I, you may have seen the statistic that they say now that up to 80%, in fact, more of a company's value um, is actually not on the books. It, it's, it's intangibles. Um, it's made up of all the different resources that it relies on. Um, and we need to change our notions of value from being about short-term investment but to being a much more longer-term perspective in our thinking um, and actually to um, encourage companies to see um, that, that actually investors, and particularly institutional investors, are starting to call for long-term thinking um, and better communication around all of the resources of what we call capitals that companies are using to create value. And, and I genuinely believe that companies in the 21st century that properly think in that way and explain how all those resources are creating value will make themselves resilient for the challenges of the 21st century. And my second point is purpose. I don't think it needs... <coughs> me to tell this room that trust has been eroded in business globally in, in, in many parts of the world. Um, and how we reconnect the idea of purpose and what business is there to achieve, again, will define, I believe, successful businesses of the 21st century. And nowhere is that more evident than in needs to invest in infrastructure, which we've touched on, um, but also to meet the goals of sustainable development and really invest in society in a way that actually engages all the people around the world um, who depend on um, good, good services. And by the way, um, business depends on if they're going to be successful over time. Um, and I'm delighted to say um, that many investors are now calling for that long-term view, Vanguard um, and uh, Black, Black Rock in the US, but, but others, who, for example, who've signed our statement on, on long-termism long and, and business value. But, but we're hearing things like a $500 billion gap in infrastructure funding around the world, a $12 trillion opportunity around the SDGs. Thinking about the purpose of the company and how we can meet those expectations of society is going to be a big way forward, and I trust that all of those will be relevant in some ways to India. Thank you, Neil, for these opening remarks, and I'll get back to you later. Mm -hmm. So, Neil uh, Munjal, you are an industry leader. Hero is one of the top companies of India in many ways. Skill development has been one of your focus areas. I mentioned it. What are your macro-level ideas for India's economy going forward? And then in the next round, maybe some micro-level ones that will come to. Yeah. So one of the things we often forget when you talk about India is that each one of us sees India in a thin slice. We are continental. We're not a country, actually. We're a, we're a civilization. We're not even a continent. 
and all the influences of a civilization exist in India at the same time. And it's often said, anything you hear about India is true. And at the same time, the exact opposite is also true. And that is India, that's India's diversity. We have more languages spoken across India than in any other continent on the planet. And the reason I'm saying this is, at a conference of this nature, we kind of tend to come at these things only from one perspective, only the economy. I'm glad somebody raised the subject of uh, social justice or sustainability. Uh, because India is about all of these. And Neil raised another interesting point about ethics and values. Uh, so one of the things that's often been said about India, as you said, we have this amazing number of young people. This is, we keep talking of the demographic dividend. If we don't train, skill, and provide economic opportunity, sustainable economic opportunity, this will be a demographic nightmare as well. Because young people are very aspirational right now. They've seen, because the whole world has improved, and India has improved dramatically in the last 30 years. We've done an amazing job. Actually, we've improved decade on decade, every decade since we became independent. India has got better. Uh, of course, the pace used to be much slower earlier. It's, it's much, much more now. Uh, so our, one of our basic needs to ensure that all of these wonderful things that the people in this session and the last session spoke about uh, was that we have to dramatically ramp up our ability on education, training, and skills. Absolutely, absolutely essential and critical for us. Uh, alongside that, it's also important to focus on things like attitudinal skills, soft skills, ethics, values, integrity. Uh, the technical skills are, are an essential and and they will happen, by the way, because we turn out more engineers than most countries in the world. Uh, unfortunately, we were doing too much of this. And, and last year, we had, I'm trying to give you a balance, not only the good stuff, but also tell you where our challenges lie. 48% uh, of the seats in the engineering schools across the country went begging. They did not get, they did not get people uh, to take admissions. We need many more doctors than we produce. We need many more nurses than we produce. By the way, we produce a lot. So on the one hand, we're doing an amazing job in moving forward at the pace that we are. But our biggest challenge continues to be the 200 odd million, nobody knows exact now, it's some, somewhere between 200 to 250 million people, which are living in such poverty they don't get two square meals a day. I think that's our single biggest challenge as a nation. So all of us who are in industry, all of us who are in in that position to be able to take a decision which, which helps or drives policy, need to ensure that that underlies all of our focus all the time. Because the moment you can do that, this country will, is already flying. At the top end, we're doing so well. You know, we launched satellite at three quarters the price of the, but making the movie Gravity. And by the way, it's a fact. We set a record of launching 109 uh, sat, uh, satellites off one, uh, one spaceship. So, we do an amazing job at the top end. Our challenge lies as you take a couple of steps down. And that, I think, is important. And that, I think, is sometimes getting missed out. The changes that are being proposed now, by the way, are, are wonderful uh, in terms of uh, focus on the new look at education as a policy, looking at vocational skills being part of uh, school curriculum, uh, opening this up much more to the private sector than it's been open earlier, opening ourselves to foreign uh, education institution much more than we've done earlier. I think all of these are very welcome changes. We must not, we must not take our eye off the ball because speed is also important in this. It's not just important for us to do it, it's important for us to do it fast enough so the young people do not get frustrated with lack of opportunities and you have a social problem that becomes difficult to handle. You are seeing, at the fringe, you're seeing some of this already in the cities, because you have the largest migration mankind has ever seen is going to take place in India over the next 20 years. People moving from the rural to the urban areas. Already happening. To it's begun direction. already, and it's happening very quietly, but very quickly, which is why somebody mentioned urbanization as an opportunity. Rajiv spoke about that. It is a tremendous opportunity, but it's also our biggest challenge. So the beauty about India is our biggest challenges are our greatest opportunities. Lack of physical infrastructure, excessive red tape, Corruption, these are things we used to talk about as our challenges. 
each one presents an absolutely fantastic opportunity. If along with that, we club this a little bit, and but I can tell you, we are doing this, by the way. We are doing this in our schools, we do it in our colleges, we are doing this in our university. We've set up compulsory credits for ethics and moral dilemma in our university, for everybody. Compulsory credit for soft skill, for everybody. It, and it's only three years, of, three years old, but the impact it's showing is quite profound. So I think it's, it's doable, but we must not lose sight that this is as important as hard infrastructure and, and growing, making bigger businesses and creating global businesses. Sunil, thank you. I've shared the stage with you before. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. You actually hit the nail on the head when you talk about the human element. And the human element is what we are all really interested in. I mean, all the infrastructure and all the progress and everything has to ultimately result in what is called the trickle-down effect. But that trickle-down effect may take place later. Too we need to come in at all levels yep. and improve these soft skills and get that Murari Prashad or whoever is in which city of India or village, get him on the bandwagon. Thank you. And Somitra, we, we get an Indian international perspective from Somitra, who's with the Cornell University and is an expert on the digital economy, but also on uh, education. I'd like uh, Somitra, you to talk about uh, a little bit about how India can up its education level. Thank you very much. And uh, I completely agree with the comments made by my <coughs> panel members before. And let me just add a few words on how I see digital affecting India. I think it's a well-known fact, Industry 4.0 is here to stay. Uh, it's gonna change businesses in multiple ways across the world. The first point is India will not be able to benefit from digital if it actually <coughs> does not undertake a radical transformation business models of the entire business itself. So the digital transformation agenda for business is extremely critical. It doesn't matter whether it's large companies, medium-sized companies, or even smaller companies. And that's where you need leadership. Very strong leadership, very strong capabilities inside business to lead that digital change agenda, lead the digital transformation. Else, the digital transformation will not lead in competitive companies in India. The second point digital is that Yes, we are very proud of the IT industry in India, and IT industry in India was clearly the leaders you know, 25 years ago. I think we have to also realize that today, the IT industry has evolved much more bigger, the digital economy. And today in the digital economy, the leaders come from US and China. They don't come from India. And they don't come from Europe also, by the way, today. And the important question out here is, does India even have a chance to create a lead in the digital economy? Till recently, I had serious questions about it, but recently I had a long session with some people who actually work on the Aadhaar stack and the India stack and so on and so forth. And what is happening in India is on the basis of the Aadhaar system, which is really a 1.2 billion biometric database that is there in the country, there's a whole movement to create a set of APIs or different application protocol interfaces that enable a lot of innovation to happen in key sectors like health, finance, and so on. Now, this is a very different model of the digital economy evolving in India as compared to US and China where traditionally large companies like Alibaba or Facebook or whatever have created more walled gardens. The Indian model is much more open, much more granular, and if it works, there's an if out there, but if it works, it can actually become extremely powerful. So I do see for the first time that there is hope for India to create a leader, or at least become a leading economy digital space in the future. The third point digital is inequality. I think one of the facts which we tend to ignore is that the digital divide across the world, not just in India, is increasing, not decreasing. And this is very important because we tend to think that everyone has a mobile, so this will divide actually decreasing. That's not the fact. And if you look at the quality of bandwidth, the quality of data access, the quality of technical resources available to people, the divide actually is increasing across the world. Now you add to that the difference in wealth, the difference in skills, the different resources, what you're seeing is that the high income countries or the richer people in the country with more technology, more skills, more resources, are creating wealth at a faster pace than the lower income economies or lower, uh, let's say, less richer people who have technology but not as good, have skills not as good and not as much resources. 
So the income gap actually is increasing, not decreasing, and technology is acting and multiplying that effect. And that has very important implications because what it means is technology is increasing inequality in India and elsewhere in the world. You asked very briefly about education. I think Sunil already talked education, but one comment I would make really out here is that universities in, in India need to radically ramp up their collaboration with industry. I think we have great students, some great faculty, but the collaboration hackers are happening across universities and industry can be improved radically, and that's a very big area of improvement. Thank you. Thank you, and I must compliment Thanks. the panelists for sticking to the schedule. Sunil has another comment. I have a comment to make. <laughs> The, the early signs that it's working is there, are there, by the way, of, of the, uh, some of the APIs have already begun to work. Right. So it, the India stack is, is functional. Uh, so when you come next time, uh, I'll be happy to, to help you point you in some direction. You know, I know the finance, for example, is an area yeah. where it's growing a lot, so I'm aware of that. I'm just saying that it's yeah. a different model yeah. of the digital economy of growth. Course. And of if course. it happens, India yeah. can show the lead for many other parts of the world. Your point is well taken, yeah. 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 Rajiv, coming to you. Now we're going to have a two-minute uh, round for answering a pointed question. So I'm just asking you a question, Rajiv. This is uh, the manufacturing sector, your uh, sector. So no, that's not my sector, I mean, but anyway, Nico, I go mean, ahead. Uh, no, I mean in the industrial sector. The industrial sector doesn't contribute yet to enough employment. We are about 16% of the economy is the industrial sector, as you know. Yes. The services sector is about 60%, and the agriculture sector is about 15 or 20%. So your, the employment that you're giving to people, are they coming to you in the numbers you need? Is the industry the bottleneck? Is it the people element, or is it something else? Is it the government policies? Is it something that we can do? What is your vision for the growth of the industrial sector? See, uh, I'm rather, personally, I'm rather pessimistic on the growth of the manufacturing sector. Right. Right? But I'm highly optimistic on the growth of the service sector. And for the last 20 years, the average growth rate of the service sector is around 8% plus. And of the manufacturing sector is around maybe five to six percent, if that. Yes. As a result, what's happening, the service sector is becoming a larger and larger part of India's GDP, and today is around, I think, 62 percent plus. Uh, industrial is lagging behind. It's kind of a little stagnant, uh, below 25 percent. And, of course, the balance is agriculture, which you yourself said is around maybe 17 percent today. Having said that, I think the jobs that are coming are coming also from service sector. It will be lovely to get jobs in, in, in the manufacturing sector. It's just not happening. See, China is emerged for many, many decades now as the largest manufacturing hub in the world. India has emerged in the last 10 years as the largest back office in the world of the knowledge economy, the data, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the growth paths of these two is different. But I think as Sunil pointed out, in the high tech, India has made good progress. Not that China has not. I mean, whether it's missile technology or certain other technologies, we are very, very good. And now what's happening uh, in the age of digitization and the age of startups, India has already emerged as the third largest startup nation in the world. Right? And that's growing quite rapidly. It'll be interesting to know that by 2025, I think India will have about 100,000 startups working, whose value is estimated to be around $1 trillion. Not the turnover, but the value of this company. And they are going to create jobs of over 3 million people. Today, IT, in any case, uh, has an employment direct of 3.2, approximately, million people. And double that, or more than double that, in the, in the support or service providers to the IT. Yeah, one is to two is the norm, typically. Yeah, like, so then can I tell you why I think manufacturing will work? But I think what would be next. useful if yeah. Sunil could, perhaps, with your, with your permission, of course, Talk a little more about the Aadhaar, 
which you touched on as the, or you, Samantha, touched upon as the 1.2 billion people who already registered with biometrics and how that's helping the poor man and how that's helping the growth of the digital economy. Why, why don't you touch on that? In Sunil? fact, uh, sure. I was going to say that with Neil's sure. permission, we're going to go to Sunil now. And Sunil, while you're touching yep. on that, if you could also touch on R&D, yep. research, which India is still to make strides in. Yep, sure. So if you, if you permit, I want to go back a little bit. Please why do. manufacturing will now work in India. All right, please do. <laughs> so if you, if you uh, see what's been happening is, it's, it's a little bit confusing when you look at these numbers. Every manufacturing job creates three to five manufacturing-related services jobs as well. Every single manufacturing job, by right. the way. So when you say services growing, some of it is growing as a multiplier of manufacturing as well. Okay. Logistics, packaging, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff. It goes around any manufacturing facility. Second, because of GST, our logistics cost, which were the highest, we had 14% logistics costs, the highest in the world. Because we used to position warehouses based on the tax in the state, not on where the business required it, 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 it to be. So our logistics cost has always been completely out of whack. That is correcting itself so rapidly. And a lot of the business, which was not, not seen, it was all below the table kind of thing. Invisible. It, it was invisible in, business, all coming into the mainstream. Yeah. The, that impact of that will be absolutely profound within the next one to three years. I'm not talking about 30 years. One to three years, you'll see the impact it's of that. It's already happening. I it's see. begun to happen. GST you've is seen, ready. Yeah, uh, the numbers, 3.4 million additional registrations. Uh, you see the registration on, on, on taxes. It, so it, all the signs are there. And we have the ability to leapfrog a few stages, as we've done in some other uh, industry verticals as well. I'll, I'll just go to the, the, to the Aadhaar, and, and the, and the, if you have the time. So the Aadhaar thing is quite unique. It is the largest. Uh, digital identity system in the world <coughs> with nine biometric features of each individual. And more than 95% more than Indians are already registered. So we have more than a billion digital identities. We have more than a billion phone connections. We have more than a billion bank accounts. And you, the moment you connect these, this is magical what's begun to happen. The saving that the Indian government already has received at the early stage of transferring subsidies directly into people's accounts is staggering. All of that money, on top of the savings we had because of low oil prices, gave us a, a, a big, big jump forward in what we could achieve in creating new systems. And some of that money is going towards digitalization, to, to Shamitra's point. Uh, but our weakness has been India's inability to develop new products and innovate ourselves. Well, we used to innovate. But development of new products was our weakness. Our spend on R&D was a pittance compared to what India needs and what any developing country like ours should have, and certainly far below developing, developed nations. But there is clear realization, and I gave this example, I was in another meeting yesterday actually in London, so I gave this example of, of our own two-wheeler company. We used to have a joint venture with Honda for 27 years. When we bought Honda out of the company, everybody's question was, how will this company run? without Honda's technology. No. Now this company continues to be the leader in the country. It's still the number one country, uh, company in the world. And it has developed every product de development capability in-house and set up five development centers around the world. So it doesn't take much except an attitude. And I think <coughs> that attitude, part of it is coming per force as Indian companies want to turn global. And part, you're being forced to do it because there is just intense competition. So I think in the next 10 years, we will see a significantly different position on new product development and design capabilities, because design thinking itself is one of the new subjects being introduced. Again, to the point of education that we were talking about, this has to come into our education itself, not just for, for companies. Absolutely. In fact, India's top conglomerates, let's say Tata's, Aditya Birla Group, Reliance, I mean, let's name them, not doing enough in terms of spend on R&D. Private universities in India, universities not doing enough on spend on R&D, not enough PhDs being created. 90,000 PhDs from India are actually employed in the US. 90,000. Those who are there, they've, they've migrated. In India, we don't have enough research PhD happening. The private sector, the government, the academia need to get together. 
and focus. So I'm moving to Neil now. And uh, Neil, you spoke about reporting. You spoke about, you didn't speak about it, but the fact that companies need to be more disciplined when the economy grows, more transparent, more compliant. So how can India ensure that? Yeah. Well, well I think the, we, what we always say is um, tell your story because it makes you more investable for the long term. And, and I think there's often a reluctance from companies to really explain how they create value. Now, R&D is, is a secret because it's going to give us a competitive advantage. But, but actually, the, the, the reality is that with the big data out there around the world, actually much more information is out there than you think. And, and we can be sure that investors and actually all opinion formers, your, your customers, your key suppliers, are forming opinions about your businesses through the data they are having access to. And they're getting it from multiple sources. And in fact, some of the leading institutional investors and I are putting in place vast systems that will churn data to try and come up with new investment insights that give them an advantage. So, so I actually think to answer your question, it's about harnessing this transparency to tell how in a holistic way you're, you're using all those resources to create value is what's going to make the difference. I mean, let's be honest, we, we live in a system that rewards short-termism, and many leading actors have now started to say this, from the, particularly, I think, the Financial Stability Board through um, the Task Force on, on Financial-Related Climate Disclosures. Um, TCFD, I always get that the wrong way around. <laughs> Task Force on Climate-Related um, um, Financial Disclosures. Um, and, and that's really putting these big issues in the board about how they are thinking about these longer-term impacts on their business that, that could actually have a significant um, impact on their long-term prospects and their long-term value. So, so I think the clue to all of this is that, that boards need to be more disciplined about they have, how they think about what, what we call multi-capitals. What are all the resources that they rely on and need to engage in order to um, create value? If I can make one comment on education, because it seems to be an emergent theme. You know, I think it is true that um, lots of management schools have, have actually put out lots of um, skills that, that do actually perpetuate this kind of short-term capital thinking, you know, analysts for return over the short term. And so I think we need to recalibrate education so that um, people are thinking, well, how is this organization going to be resilient and create value over the longer term? And, and that's the only way we're going to engineer and change trust in business and really orient the sort of like the purpose of business towards the achievement of the other things we've all spoken about, sustainable development goals, um, the empowerment of people, the development of people, um, and the elevation of, of the poorest. And so, so we do need to recalibrate our thinking in those areas. Absolutely, Neil. So before I go to the audience, I'm going to request uh, Swamitra to make a concluding remark on something that I'm going to just point out. After this, we're going to have the questions round. Swamitra, uh, we're basically talking about the youth of India. And you said that if he has a mobile phone, it doesn't necessarily mean that he is technologically with it. Let's say he's still underprivileged in terms of the digital economy. How do we enable him a little more? And how does he a person who wants to be an entrepreneur is innovative. Uh, I don't think the bandwidth is so much of an issue now as perhaps just the access to technology. And you know, there are people, there is a story of a coolie who's a porter on the railway station of uh, Bangalore who has made it to the civil services just by studying on the internet. He didn't go to any formal education. How do we get all these people on the bandwagon? So you know, it's a... Uh not an easy story, to be very honest. I think, you know, you always have these exceptional things you talk about, but to doing it for everyone at population scale is very hard. And it includes a number of elements, you know. It includes the access, which is basically access to infrastructure, the cost and affordability. It includes the skills that you need to have to be able to use it, to be able to actually, you know, small businesses don't have the skills to access some of the online resources that are very useful for small businesses. And it requires the content in different languages because not content in English is easily accessible, consumable by, consumed by different people in India. So combining all these things together is actually very hard. Uh, recently, I had a meeting with uh, the group that runs Ake Step, which is one of the foundations set up by Nanda Lenakani in India. And one of the goals is to try and change or at least bring technology education on a population scale. And one of the insights really was that, you know, they started out by copying the American system of, you know, uh, 
uh, different online systems and saying, okay, people will use online content and so on and so forth, quickly realized that that will just simply not work in India, where even today, 21% of the schools have just one teacher for all the classes. I mean, the level of infrastructure, level of support is, is tremendously weak, and you have situations where teachers are stuck to the textbooks. They don't want to give up the textbooks. So what they're doing right now is they're having a system in which they're creating curated content in which they're putting QR codes on the textbooks. And a professor or a teacher can, in fact, scan the QR code and get a whole range of associated content. It might seem very low techy but that's the way to get technology into effect education at a large scale, they're doing it in six states right around India. So what I'm just trying to say out here is that it's a, it's a very difficult story and it requires a lot of effort, a lot of uh, initiative to do this population scale. You always have a few examples, those exceptions don't represent the reality. Absolutely of correct, I agree with you, Swamit. So this panel has actually been brilliant, I must compliment you. Uh, of course, we still have the questions to be answered, mm. so I'll reserve some compliments for the end. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, I see three hands. My request to you all, no, I see six hands, uh, is to stick to about 30 seconds and ask a question. Well, after you've given your name. Yes, sir. My question is to Mr. Munjal. He gave an example uh, of uh, Hero Honda becoming hero. <coughs> My question to him is that when he was Hero Honda, he must be having a global perspective of uh, exporting uh, uh, vehicles made in India with Hero Honda. After Hero, what has been the picture? There is another case which I would like to highlight. After is that Honda, you mean? <laughs> you mean after Honda? After, after Honda. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is another case where we have commercial vehicles made by Daimler Benz. And Daimler Benz has imported the entire technology into India and uh, they have started making their trucks but then they chose to change the name to Bharat Benz for Indian application because they thought that making in India these trucks may not be sellable as far as Europe or other markets are concerned. So I, can, I, I can want to have to your guidance sure. as how you have managed. So you didn't give your name, you gave the company's Yeah, name. my name is uh, Shailendra Goswami. I come uh, from Pune, my company group, uh, I'm the chairman and manager. Thank you, sir. So I can actually respond to your second question first, if you like. Uh, I was the chairman of that company, Daimler Benz in India, by the way. Uh, the product was not called Bharat Benz when it started. It was actually supposed to be Hero Benz. When we stepped out of the joint venture, they had to rebrand it. That's why they put Bharat there uh, in that place. It actually took, took them many months to agree to have a joint brand. They've never done it in their history. They agreed after looking at how the brand uh, Hero worked in India and South Asia. Uh, and it went twice to their board before they could agree. But when we walked out of the joint venture, which we decided for, for a whole different set of reasons, uh, they had to, to re everything was already done. The stationery was done. So they got called Bharat Benz then. Uh, the product was, was actually developed. It's a brand new product. It's not a product brought from outside. It's a brand new product developed with with very unique qualities related to what Indian and emerging markets are. Um, but I'll go back to, to your earlier question. Uh, as long as uh, Honda was part of the company, uh, we were not actually allowed to freely export. This is one of the reasons actually that the, the joint venture uh, finally phased out was two or three constraints which were put in there due to an agreement which was signed in 1984. Now the company is exporting to more than 30 countries already, uh, all in this space of a few years. And the plan is to continue to, to up this uh, over a period of time. And these exports are also going to some uh, developed markets now. Uh, the products being developed in markets like the US itself, uh, products being developed in Austria, products being developed in Japan uh, for the world markets uh, by the company. It's eminently doable, uh, <coughs> I think. In India, it's really a matter of an attitude which, as I said earlier, you can increasingly see coming in more and more companies, and I hope it moves faster and in a much larger number of companies. Thank you, Sunil. The gentleman in the peach colored shirt, yeah. I think I got the color right. Um, <laughs> my name is uh, Ulrich Randall. I'm from Germany, and um, I'm a, a medical doctor running an own institute for research and education. And I, um, I'm very often in India also giving courses there, 
And what I see is that India goes a total wrong way in the medical field. We are following the Western style of medicine. And you cannot succeed with such, such a system for acute medicine for 1.3 billion people. So uh, just care about your traditions and make and go, and go the way of Ayurvedic medicine and accompany it uh, scientifically. So this is the only chance you have in India because uh, the medical industrial uh, complex is poisoning the whole, whole world. In Germany, we are uh, doing operations on people, especially spine, hip and knee uh, operations. Uh, and I can tell you 60% of the operations are not necessary. So the market, the human body, and you said the human body is in the middle of every, every market, you know. So we should not throw the health into the market. And so please continue and make uh, Ayurvedic scientifically. You are absolutely right, by the way. And I can tell you that uh, I, I chair a large teaching hospital in India. And we are experimenting now with what we like to call holistic healing. We're using allopathic met methods along with traditional Indian medicine. Uh, but we had a, we had a bit of a uh, problem. The regulator came and told us, you can't do this. <laughs> so we are now shifted it because we also have a, a college. So uh, we shifted it from the college to the hospital because in the pure hospital, they can't really tell you to stop. So we're actually experimenting right now to try and build a model which is a bridge across different uh, medicine systems not only one and not only the other one. So we're trying to find how, because the problem with, with our traditional systems is we do not yet have enough evidentiary proof, which is, is often used to discard them by, by people. Yes. So, so we're trying to create yes. evidence right so now. We so we won't have counter questions because then everyone won't get a chance. So we'll ask yeah. someone at the end. Yeah, that's right. Someone at the end, that last, yeah. He's already got up. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vivek Segal, and I come from the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I thank the previous person who almost asked my half question. <laughs> um, my question A to the academist here on the panel is, uh, I don't think we've discussed too much on healthcare. Now, healthcare again has two perspectives. One is the industry perspective, as in the contribution being made by the healthcare industry of India, and secondly, the health of its own people, which is, again, a very, very big challenge. I haven't really heard too much on this. And from the industry side, uh, anybody would be free to respond to that. So I'd like to have an academic and an industrial perspective. I think one will do hmm. we, we, for the interest yep. of time. So much, would you like to mention? So I think, you know, there's a broader question in terms of just quantity of medical professionals. I think you mentioned already earlier that we produce not enough doctors, not enough nurses. So I think there's an important issue in terms of just producing more trained professionals. There's an important issue in terms of looking at the business models of what are employed in the hospitals, improving the operation efficiency of the various providers. Uh, there is a whole range of issues linked to payment and, pro and, and payers. You know, I think in India, the insurance market for health is not very well developed. So I think we look at the whole health issue for the citizen, there is a number of interesting issues around the professionals, the actual operations, the health sort of insurance side, and a number of other elements around it. So it's a very complex intersystem, and all countries have a very complex story on the health uh, side. <coughs> Neil will add something in a minute, yeah. I, I just wanted to touch on well-being, because I do think, obviously, sort of health and the med medicinal sense is very important, but I guess the, the, the corollary in industry is, is, is partly health and safety, but I think for many companies now it goes one step further. You know, what is, what is, how are we contributing to the well-being of our people such that they see that we are a long-term, successful, committed employer? And of course, I, I know there's a very strong tradition of that in India, um, but I think of um, Novo Nordisk, for example, um, in medicine, very clearly articulating some of its wider goals and its purpose around um, society, but also a lot of companies now think about their well-being. In fact, I'm on an advisory group for an OECD group on well-being, and they're starting to think, how can we measure well-being? And I think these are quite important, um, because when investors are looking at your company, they're increasingly looking at um, how are you treating people and how, what's your impact on society. So, so I think that kind of well-being connotation is important, too. 
Thank you. So, uh, gentlemen and ladies, we have three or four people raising hands. I'm going to request you to be very quick in your <laughs> question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Can you get you. gathered all the questions together? And might we, we might be able to answer some yeah, of okay. them. Yeah. My question is to Mr. Munjal. Uh, you have very rightly pointed out that on one side, the India is launching satellites and is on top of the line. But on the other hand, we have yet struggling to meet the basic needs of our people. Overall, there is uh, clean water, pollution, and a lot of other problems, housing, everything rather. I want to know from you as to what went wrong, whether it was a policy, or it was a bureaucratic delays, or, and if it is identifiable, are we correcting it now so that 10 years from now, because nowhere in the world we find a situation like India, where on one side we okay, are- Okay, I'll give you a quick remote. answer. Okay, I don't want to go into the history of what went wrong. I think it's pretty obvious. But what we are doing right now is actually the right thing. We may not sometimes be doing enough of it. We may not be doing it fast enough. But our direction is absolutely right at this moment. One is to try and grow the overall piece, look at the trickle down. But at the same time, intervention at different levels is absolutely essential. Without that, it will not work. You will have a social revolution uh, if you don't do that. And the model we are following right now is the right one is to try and get access to healthcare across the country, to get access to education across the country. And the only way we can do it at this moment is by using technology. Excellent. We need to harness technology for this. Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I'm Gaurav Sharma. From, I'm an MBA student from uh, IEP Business School. Uh, my question is, Mr. Mr. Call really pointed out that the main driver of our economy is the service sector, which is quite right. But I recently read an article in which Google stated that with the advancement of technologies like virtual reality and AI. Just to give one example, they, the, the coding sector will be all automated. So there goes our IT industry, and with that, the, the leverage that we have on the service sector. Uh, and we actually are IT department. We don't actually focus on R&D or anything. So how are we going to cope up with certain challenges? Which, I, which IT department? Uh, any, like technology oh, or... Yeah, call IT, yeah. mm -hmm. call? Actually, I was spilling water uh, all over myself. <laughs> <laughs> I had to open this bottle when he began asking the question. <laughs> so if you can give me the question, I'll give the answer. So basically, it's about we're not really focusing on quality and IT, the services sector. How do we grow innovation in the services sector? They're doing very basic stuff in, in yeah, we're doing uh, very services, basic stuff. which is going to get automated. Well, what, you're, what we are doing is right. What you say is right, but we're also doing a lot more to add value to those areas of innovation where we are strong, in many of those areas. So, uh, you know, I, and she's waving a hand saying this. Am I right, <laughs> young lady? Time's that's over. what you say? She's saying yes. Yep. <laughs> Time's over. And so, but I, I'll speak to you outside just as soon as I wipe myself dry, all right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, actually, I've been told that time is up, and the monitor is standing in the middle now, so I cannot say anything. <laughs> and we have three hands, two on this side, one over there. I think you'll all have to come to the stage after this and we can meet. But it's been a fascinating and uh, very good session. I must compliment the panelists. They've stuck to the schedule. They've been brilliant. A big round of applause and thank you very much. Thank you. What about thank you.